for my sixth grade English class at Bolden Elementary Middle School. The Freedom Ship of Robert Smalls by Louise Merriweather, illustrated by Jonathan Green. By the way, I moved to Beaufort, South Carolina this year and was fascinated to learn this story. And I think everyone should know about Robert Smalls. It was spring of 1851 and Robert was leaving Beaufort, South Carolina where he had been born a slave. He was going to work in Charleston to make money for his master. Mama stood in the dirt road, waving goodbye. Be sassy with your work, but not with your tongue, she called to him. Yes, Mama, he replied. Robert knew what Mama meant. Be good, work hard, and make a lot of money so Mr. McKee would not sell him. The carriage rattled past. Mr. McKee's cotton fields. Some of the slaves straightened up and waved slowly. Robert waved back, then turned around for one last look at Mama. She was little more than a lo lonely speck now, standing in the middle of the road. Robert closed his eyes. It was, not, it was not for Mama that he was going away to make money. It was for Mr. McKee. No, he would not cry. But why, why, why had he been born a slave? In Charleston, Mr. McKee found a job for Robert at $4 a week. Robert cleared the street corner lamps in the morning and lit them with a long taper at dusk. He lived with other slaves in a shanty behind the big house. Mr. McKee, seeing Robert settled, returned to Beaufort. Life in Charleston was interesting for Robert. He had never before seen, been to a big city and he liked to mingle with the noisy crowds. But the part he liked best was talking to the black men who had been able to buy their freedom. Moses the carpenter was not free, but he could read. He thrilled Robert with tales of Nat Turner, Denmark Visay, and others who rebelled against slavery. He read to Robert from a newspaper written by Frederick Douglass, a former slave. Frederick Douglass had escaped to the North and was now fighting for the freedom of all slaves. Often, Robert sat by the sea wall in Charleston and thought about Frederick Douglass and other free black men. They could learn to read and write. They could keep their money they, were, they earned. They could live wherever they wanted to. No one was their master. One day, Robert promised himself he too would be free. Three years passed. Robert worked on many jobs for Mr. McKee. He unloaded ships at the dock. He learned to make sails and attach them to the mast. When he was 17, he met a lovely young slave girl named Hannah Jones in church. Hannah worked as a maid at a hotel. She paid her wages to her master as Robert did. Robert and Hannah soon fell in love and with their permission of their owners, were married on December 24th, 1856. A year later, their daughter Elizabeth was born. Robert held the baby in his arm, marveling at how fragile she was, but his wife and child were owned by a white man, Samuel Kingman. He could sell them away from Robert at any time. This thought kept nagging Robert, it would not let him rest. Finally, he went to see Mr. Kingman. Sell me my wife and child, he pleaded. Let me buy their freedom. But Kingman agreed, Mr. Kingman agreed, for a price of $800. $800? Robert was staggered by the amount that he and Hannah accepted the challenge. They took on even more work. Sometimes they worked so hard that they were too weary to sleep but they save penny by penny, year by year.
Then, in 1861, the Civil War began. Robert was secretly on the side of the North because the North black people were free. However, he, made, he was made to work for the Confederate Navy as a wheelman and a gunboat called the Planter. The captain of the Planter, his towmates were white. The rest of the crew were slaves. Now Robert grew impatient. He and Hannah had saved $700, yet there was no freedom in sight. His family had grown to include a son, Robert Jr., whom he would have to buy. The price of freedom had gone up. He had to think of another way. Charleston was too well guarded for him to escape by land. But what about by sea? Three forts had their guns trained on the harbor. Why couldn't he capture the planter and sail her right past the guns? The northern fleet was anchored seven miles outside of the harbor. Freedom was only seven miles away. Robert discussed his plans with the slave crew of the planter, and each man was eager to join him. They decided to take their wives and children with them. If anything went wrong, they would blow up the ship and die rather than be captured. On May 13, 1862, Robert Smalls made his move. He sneaked the women and children onto a second ship anchored in the Cooper River. The ship's stu steward, a fellow slave, had agreed to hide them. They would be taken about the planter after Robert took command. That night, Captain Relays and his two mates went ashore, and Robert Smalls took over. He readied the ship for action. Jackson, Alston, and Turnow the firemen shoveled fuel into the furnaces. John, the engineer, checked the instruments. Jebel raised the Confederate flag while Alfred cast off the ship's lines. Robert, at the wheel, wearing the captain's hat, steered the planter away from the dock. The desperate trip had begun. When he neared the second ship anchored on the Cooper River, Robert sent a rowboat for the five women and three children. The steward also came aboard, making a total of 16 slaves. Robert headed the ship upstream. He did everything he had seen Captain Relier do. The planter approached Fort Jackson. Robert pulled the cord on the steam whistle and gave the proper salute. The planter often steamed upriver before dawn. There was no reason for the sentry on shore to think this time was any different. The sentry yelled, Pass the planter! Fort Moultrie came next. Robert gave the whistle salute, and again, they were passed safely. But the most dangerous part was yet to come. Fort Sumter was the biggest fort. It was almost dawn, and Robert could see the fort's menacing cannons. Would the sentry be able to see that it was not Captain Relier beneath the hat, but a slave? Robert leaned on the windowsill of the pilot house. He folded his arms across his chest, as he had seen captain, the captain do. Jebel pulled the signal cord. Robert waved to the sentry on the shore. The sentry did not answer. Robert, at the wheel, wearing the captain's hat, steered the planter away from the dock. The desperate trip had begun. Robert prayed silently, let us sail through safely. Finally, he heard the sentry yell, pass the planter. They were not going to be blown out of the water. They were saved. Robert piloted the ship past the fort's huge guns and out to the open sea. By the time the sentry realized something was wrong and fired his guns, the planter was out of range. The crew and their families crowded the rail. They had gambled with death and won. Robert and Hannah looked at each other and at their children. They were free. No longer would they have to call any man master. 
they were free at last. Jebel pulled down the Confederate flag and raised the white flag of truce. When they reached the ships of the Northern fleet, Robert turned the planter over to the fleet captain. The, the planter was of great value to the North, valued at more than $60,000. The ship became part of the North's Navy. Robert Smalls became her captain. After the North won the war, Captain Smalls, as he was now known, returned to Beaufort with his family. There he was elected to the United States Congress and served for five terms, fighting always for equal rights for his people. Captain Robert Smalls remained a hero for the rest of his life. As a boy, he dreamed of freedom. As a man, he took it. And that is the end.